Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Atlanta. We're here at SC24 in the Atlanta Convention Center. My name is Dave Vellante. Savannah Peterson is also here with John Furrier, and we're super excited. Back when I started in the industry, mainframes were everything. They were they were water-cooled mainframes. That's you, every time you did a briefing at IBM, they they'd bring out this big cold plate and they'd give you 20 minutes on that. Well, when the microprocessor took over, air-cooled became the thing. Well, liquid-cooled is back to support and power the AI wave. We're super excited to have the liquid direct liquid cooling panel. Dr. Luca Amalfi is to my left. He's the CEO and founder of Seguente. And to my right is Dion Harris, who's the director of Accelerated Data Center Go to Market at NVIDIA, you've heard of them. And Tim Shedd, he's an engineering technologist at Dell Technologies. Gentlemen, welcome to the panel, welcome back Thank to theCUBE. Great Thanks to see you guys, Thank Thank you so much for the first time. invitation. So, Luca, let's start with you. We know Dell, we know NVIDIA, their household name, Seguente. What's, first of all, <coughs> what does that mean? <laughs> what does that stand for? What tell us about the company? So actually, uh, Seguente is an Italian word, which means next, whatever comes next. And since uh, um, Seguente is a technology player, uh, with ah. the, um, many of the co-founders that they have Italian roots, we basically stick with an Italian word. So I, again, pleasure to be here today. Okay, great. And and so, and your specialty is with Seguente, obviously liquid cooling. Direct liquid cooling. So yeah, the, let me elaborate a, li a little bit more here. Um, what Seguente does, I believe we have the mission to support the scaling of uh, artificial intelligence technology and uh, HPC, high performance compute, in a way that we would like to um, basically to deploy the full end-to-end -end solution. When I say full end-to-end -end solution is uh, IT, the hardware, the networking piece and the storage. Basically we rack and stack into racks of course, and then uh, we basically we deploy according also with the uh, um, cooling cooling systems. But the flagship that we have in Seguente is really our unique passive direct to chip to phase cooling technology, which basically operates without uh, any water and uh, any pumps. So we minimize the en the, en the energy consumption. Okay. So this is the value add that we provide to our. And we'll, we'll come back to that. I want to dig into the to the technology and how you guys do that. But I, I want to go to Tim. I was just in your lab a couple weeks ago, down in, I guess it was in Round Rock. Correct. Right, which was awesome <laughs> and loud. <laughs> and we, were, we were listening to GPUs, we were exercising them, we were feeling the heat coming off, and you guys have done some amazing work there. But explain your role at Dell and a little bit about the lab that we saw. Sure. Uh, first, thanks for the invitation. It's great to be on this panel. Um, I work in the CTO's office at Dell and I lead our thermal strategy for all of our data center products. So whenever a challenge comes up, like needing to deliver racks, hundreds, thousands of racks of 64 NVIDIA GPUs, uh, we need to find a way to cool them. And more than that, to make the entire rack operate very efficiently. So really cooling is just a tool to enable energy efficient computing. And so uh, what you saw and, and what, uh, to, to describe what we did with the uh, H100 servers that you looked at, were uh, deploying those eight, 64 GPUs with a rear door heat exchanger. So we liquid cooled the rack while keeping water out of the chassis. And it turns out that that met a whole bunch of TCO, energy efficiency, and um, the ability to, de to deploy very quickly to the customer. Uh, met all those requirements kind of all at once. Um, what you also saw was the beginning of uh, some, some hints at our next generation of That's it. once the, the GPUs are getting to higher and higher powers, we are bringing liquid into the server, right to the chip, in collaboration with our partners at NVIDIA, so that we can continue this trend of offering dense, energy efficient, rapid time to deployment. Uh, uh, and we heard at OCP this year, the, the call for using a warmer liquid. Um, of course, Dion, everybody at NVIDIA, uh, almost everybody has to be technical. <laughs> so you've got to sure. be, you're working with customers, helping them figure out how to design Absolutely. this new accelerated uh, data center. But explain a little bit about yeah. your role. Yeah, so basically as, as um, I'm a part of the accelerated data center team. And so what I, what I say there is that NVIDIA is no longer selling a GPU, we're really selling customers a data center. We're obviously working with our partners and ecosystem to enable that, 
but essentially by you know sort of championing this new computing model called accelerated computing, it's also requiring us to think differently about how we think about infrastructure, how we think about building out these data centers, how we think about the workloads that run in these data centers. And so through doing that, like I said, we're looking at lots of different innovative ways to give more performance out of that computing stack, out of that networking stack. And oftentimes it, it involves driving more compute density, which therefore requires you know, different, different innovations, whether it be through the liquid cooling, through you know, the, the bus bars, through the entire infrastructure that supports the this, this specific you know, computing infrastructure. Okay, so let's talk about liquid cooling. Yeah. Um, we have all these data centers that have been built for air, air cooling, and now we're, we're, we're transitioning. <laughs> Uh, Luca, let's start with you. What's your perspective on you know, where we've come from, where are we today, and, and then we'll get into where we're going. Sure, so I guess if we um, talk about the landscape, right? So we started at a very early stage with um, 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 Isle Containment, which is air-based cooling uh, across multiple length scales, which means um, uh, inside the servers, the rack, and the room, right? Um, and then the progression was, as Tim mentioned, that to be able to basically reduce the energy consumption, actually move to a rear door solution. With the rear door solution, what we, we basically do, the primary heat transfer mechanism within the server is still air, air in forced convection, but the rear door will allow us to basically capture the heat uh, before it goes into the aisle of the data center so that you can basically offload some of the energy consumption on the HVAC system. Um, but then, oh, of course, NVIDIA and Dell and all the big, the big players, we are pushing the power, the TDP of these chips, right? So we need to go um, localize on the CPUs and the GPUs. And that was the transition from, I call indirect liquid cooling to direct li liquid cooling. Basically flowing water into the coal plate and the coal plate are directly attached on the CPUs and GPUs. So we, we've seen right. some of that walking around the yes. show. Sure. So it's now direct liquid cooling, meaning the the, yes. the, the, the liquid, whether it's water or something else, mm -hmm. right on top of the, yeah. the, the GPU, correct? Absolutely, yeah. So you basically have your coal plates, which allows you to eject the cool fluid in, to retract the heat fluid, the, the warm fluid out, and then go through some heat exchanger to, to dissipate the heat. So it's a more efficient way of transferring the heat off of the GPUs. And it also allows you to have a much more dense, densely compute, um, densely packed compute rack. And so that again leads to a lot of the efficiency that you get out of there as well. And Tim, we're used to when you go out, walk around a data center, you see a hot aisle, you go to the hot aisle, you put your hand back there, it's hot. Well, in your, in your lab, the hot aisle's inside the rack. So the, there's not like super hot air coming out. That's, uh, 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 is that a new innovation, relatively new innovation? Explain that. Sure, so no, it's not new. Um, and uh, all of this technology, as you alluded to already, was actually originally used for you know, the mainframe era. Um, kind of fell out of fashion, but it's really come back with a force. I mean, Dell's been shipping tens of thousands of liquid cold servers a year since 2018. So this is, this is actually something that's just a continuation uh, and a, obviously a rapid growth from there. But what you noticed and, and what we like to think about and I think is consistent with what you all are doing at NVIDIA sure. is talking about instead of hot aisles and cold aisles, we're talking about wet aisles and dry, dry aisles now, right? Right. right? We're gonna be distributing liquid through in one aisle and feeding liquid to those racks and uh, maybe to rear door heat exchangers, maybe to DLC, maybe to both. Right. And then th what this does is kind of opens up space, it opens up the operating environment so that you're, we're no longer constrained by all of the challenges of getting air to the racks. We can now focus on the compute yeah. and building those that, that compute that our customers need and deliver it, like I said, as fast as, fast as possible. So Dion, when you're talking to customers, what, is, what are you learning yeah. about the main challenges of moving from air-cooled to liquid-cooled? I've been talking about a potentially could be the weakest link sure. of this hundreds of billions <laughs> of dollars in this. We've got bad connection integrity. Boy, sure. we'd be a foolish industry if we didn't take yeah. care of that. You got to yeah. design it in up front, almost like security, sure. physical. Yeah, um, well, I think what's interesting is we've been working with a number of partners to actually meet the customers where they are. In some cases, they're looking to do a retrofit, like you said, sort of a hybrid where you have a hot, um, hot not just hot and cold, but you know, wet and, wet and dry. So we do have some customers who are deploying hybrid solutions and retrofitting parts of their data center for liquid and leaving others that are completely air cooled. So working with, with various partners in the infrastructure um, ecosystem, 
it's allowing us to meet the customers where they are. Um, obviously, if you have a green field, you can approach it slightly differently where you're building from the bottom floor and understanding how and where you want to deploy, um, say for example, a fully liquid cooled you know, GB200 MVL72, for example. Um, but there's some instances where we're talking to customers and they're deploying a black well and they want to have some liquid cooled, they want to have you know, a, a, a air cooled H100 aisle. And so you're starting to see a lot of these mixing and matching where it's not one size fits all anymore. It really is going to be dependent on the workload and then therefore dependent on the customer and where they are in their journey. So you guys expect that hybrid, that air cooled, liquid cooled hybrid will, will be the, the, the norm going forward. It's, is, it, is, is that right or do you see it as a stepping stone? Well, I think depending on where the customers are, mm -hmm. oftentimes most customers are kind of challenged to, to spin up a net new data center, right? And so oftentimes as they're looking to bring on new workloads and adopt a lot of the latest and greatest technologies, oftentimes it, it involves retrofitting existing data centers. And so through that replacement mechanism, you're starting to see a lot more of these hybrid designs where, where customers are actually running both, you know, liquid-cooled uh, devices along with air-cooled as well. Now, I, I would imagine that customers are concerned about leakage. I think that's pretty, some pretty expensive sure. assets on the floor. So how are you, uh, how are you um, assuaging that concern? <laughs> so, number one rule we will all agree on, don't leak. Right. right. So the first <laughs> thing <laughs> first is focus on the quality. Um, this industry, although it's been around a while, is, is just having to mature really rapidly. And so it takes folks like, leaders like NVIDIA and Dell to get in there and go to the suppliers and say, okay, your quality needs to be here, not here. And so we're introducing greatly enhanced quality checks. We're checking all along the way from integration to deployment to ensure that, as well as innovating on leak detection technology. So if a leak does occur, we can react appropriately as the customer wants. Yeah. And, and you'll see new technologies coming out for rack isolation, for server isolation, so that we can address these and address these fears, you know, first by, don't leak, right? right. Getting our quality <laughs> to, to better than five nines. But then if a leak does occur, minimizing any potential blast radius or damage that could occur from that, that uh, leak. Okay. So we got air cooled, we got water cooled, we got warm water cooled, we have immersion, we have phase change, we have phase change immersion. Yeah. What am I missing? <laughs> Luca, lay it out for us, the different options that we have, and I want to get into phase change and get your guys' thoughts on you know, where the industry's headed. We're seeing with Blackwell, some, you know, there's some challenges in, in cooling Blackwell, and the industry's going to solve that. As it, it's just amazing, this industry. We run into to, to roadblocks, we blow through them, how, what's your perspective on the options that are out there and how they're evolving? Lay them out for us. Sure. So I guess Tim was mentioning about the water-based cold plate. So we can basically run uh, uh, full water or we can run also a mixture between the water and glycol. Uh, this is part of a single phase. What is the definition of single phase? That during the heat transfer, the fluid stays in the liquid phase, right? And then we are basically using the a sensible heat, which is the temperature rise of the water across the cold plate to take the heat from the CPUs and GPUs. Then, of course, there is another mechanism that I believe is very, very much viable, is, is to say the industry has already made the investment in water-based cold, cold plate, right? So they have cold plate, cold plate loops, manifold, and the CDUs. Can we have something that basically keep the same building blocks, but actually can, can have uh, value proposition uh, in addition to water, right? And I think the next level that we are, we, we're actually working very closely at Seguente is to basically, um, instead of using just water, is to use a, a dielectric fluid, which has a very low boiling point, and then you, you store the energy from the CPUs and GPUs in the, into the conversion of liquid and vapor. So when you can take that energy into the fluid, uh, and then you have a liquid and vapor, you can do so many things, because now you have two options. You can just keep the same active, direct-to-chip two-phase cooling, uh, use a pump to basically push the fluid into the system, or actually you can use a passive implementation, because now when you have the vapor and the liquid, uh, the vapor is lighter than the liquid, what actually we do, and can basically ha use the buoyancy force to, to drive the fluid up to a top of the rack in rack CDUs, where you will condense the two-phase mixture back to liquid, and then you basically um, 
um, in a, a self-sustained system, you can feed the loop, the loop again. So you, you can think about that uh, in um, the system that we developed that is called coldware, you basically you use the phase change and the evaporation and the condensation to move the heat from the hot chips to the to the to the cold side, which is the condensation. Okay, side, right? so we've seen phase change in this industry before, way, way back to the days of optical disc. That's it. We <laughs> we did a phase change that flipped from a one yeah. to a zero. This is a totally yeah. different use case. <laughs> but no, Dion, I'd love to get your thoughts on this because yeah. here's Seguente doing this, you, you know, advanced R and D. Yeah. From your standpoint, hey. Go for it. Anything that will yeah. will help with the problem. But what's your take on yeah. on face chips? I've read some things that say that Nvidia is a, a fan of it. But yeah. like, I, you guys are kind of a fan of anything yeah. that's <laughs> going to help solve the problem. But what's your yeah. what's your take on this? So, so you know, I think in general, we're supportive of the ecosystem. And and so, historically, I mean, you have direct liquid cooled options. You have you know, two phase heat uh, liquid options as well on our hopper platform. It's just with Blackwell was the first time that we actually, I would say, productize a direct mm -hmm. liquid cool solution. But it doesn't mean we're, you know, we're not supportive of what the ecosystem is doing to offer innovative cooling so solutions. So today, for Blackwell, it's it's the liquid, li direct liquid cooled single phase that like we talked about. Um, but like I said, this is, you know, very early in the days of 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 these new systems coming online. And so, it, yeah, I think it's one of those things that. We're always looking at new and new and innovative ways to make sure that we can deliver the most efficient solution. So, today, like I said, I you know you can see it happening in Hopper. We have a lot of partners who are who are delivering dual phase, and I think it's it's a great thing. That was a very ecosystem friendly answer. Yeah, so well true. done, yeah. well done. It, it is true. Yeah. Okay, but so now, but now, Tim, you guys are, are talking massive scale here. Dell, hundred billion dollar company. You're 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 driving. You, you know, huge, huge volumes. We talked, and your roadmap, mm -hmm. Dion, is very public. Yeah. And it's not like you guys hide your roadmap, Absolutely. you know what's coming. And we talked in your lab about the march to 3,000, 3,000 watts per, yeah. per GPU, right? <laughs> so so you're today, you're obviously taking a very practical approach to this. Um, what's your take on the future? How far can, you know, your current sort of warm water methodology take you? What's your take, you know, tip, tapping into your PhD background on, on two phase. Sure. Um, so first off, Luke and I know each other pretty well. Um, I love bubbles. Um, <laughs> love bubbles. We love we all love bubbles. Yeah. How could you not love so, bubbles? I, I was a professor for quite some time and, and bubbles were my thing. As yeah. if you look at my publication record, that's that's what we did. Um, but the reality is like you said, at Dell we don't sell a hundred or something. We sell ten thousand or something or more, right? And what we've done is we've very carefully evaluated the technologies in the field for Dell's business case and for what will provide the best value at this time for our customers. And what we've locked in on is single phase direct to chip cooling. It's something that we understand. We've got a lot of experience in it and we can scale it. And uh, that's, that's the key thing. We can scale this from tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands to millions of cold plates a year as needed. And we're planning on that. And so that's the real key. The other piece of it is you were saying the, the, the journey to 3000, right? So we've got a really strong core team within Dell and we've looked at this and we've said, you know what? It's not easy, yeah. but with some innovation, we see that we can keep warm water cooling, water, facility water above 30 degrees Celsius or above 90 F, we can keep that going all the way out that journey to 3,000 watts. Okay. And that provides energy savings for our customers, best TCO, and using the power that's available to do the work on the, right. the processors yeah. to make the money that they're paying for rather than paying for the utilities to run air conditioning, right? right. So we do see single phase uh, direct to chip taking us all the way out there with some innovation that we're working on today. Yeah, I mean, and I think one thing, one thing I'll just add, I, I mean, one of the main reasons for the transparency, and like you mentioned, we've, we've been more public with roadmaps than we have in the past, is exactly that reason. We want the ecosystem to see what's coming, to plan for it, and, and, and sort of innovate and adopt where needed. Right, you guys are transparent to your customers that are <laughs> trying to build competitive products, which is, a, which is the right yeah. thing to do. I mean, yeah. hey, the industry, it's a big business. It's not sure. like sure. any of these hyperscalers are going out of business. But yeah. Luke, I want to come back to you because Tim mentioned TCO. And you and I have talked about you know, your philosophy on, on TCO. So a number of things there. 
can you scale two phase? What about the supply chain? I've, I've, I've read uh, all about condensation and pumps and everything else. How do you solve those problems? So this is a great, a great question. So I, I want to basically uh, talk about the supply chain a lot because I hear multiple times that one of the reasons why two-phase cooling is seen more challenging to deploy is because of the supply chain. Right, okay. Um, and what we, we see at Seguent is really that if we keep things as that are in single-phase cooling, yeah, we can basically deploy two-phase cooling system as we do with the single-phase cooling system. At the end, uh, what is water-based cooling? Is a copper uh, cold play loops, right? Then they have uh, a stainless steel manifold or a metallic manifold, and, and then the inner row CDU. So what we did at Seguente, actually we keep the same building blocks. The supply chain is uh, diversified in enough. So we have dual source or more than dual source for each individual components. But uh, so I, I don't see challenge in scaling, right? Because as they produce cold play loops for um, single phase, they can produce for two phase. And there is already in place QA and QC uh, in, in um, place as well. So uh, two phase is, a, I believe, can scale. And also there are significant advantage. I mean, team, I respect team a lot. I think he's a great scientist and, uh, and uh, a great industry player. But Im imagine, right? Uh, water base, it doesn't leak, but it, it may leak. So, 1% um, of the case, but what we see with the two-phase, there is also the advantage that um, we remove the worry from the customers about the leakage, right? Because if the refrigerant is going to leak, the refrigerant is a low boiling point fluid. So, it's going to be vapor at the ambient condition, plus also is a dielectric fluid. If it's a dielectric fluid and there is a leak, there is no arm to the, to the, to, to, to the electronics. So I see um, a lot of advantage, and also I see something that I, I do like. I do have a PhD in phase change cooling, so I am a little bit biased. <laughs> right? uh, um, I, I like the scaling, right? The scaling is the key. If I can use, if I can store the, 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 e the energy in the energy conversion from liquid to, um, to vapor, I have to do less engineering or less innovation to be able to cool a three kilowatts per chip. Now today in my lab, we already have a passive two-phase coal plate, which is cooling three kilowatts, is, is, is an ASICS, and is simply by leveraging the latent heat instead of the, sen the sensible heat. So um, this is my thought, and, uh, and um, I would like to get so, back to you as well. So uh, my understanding was there were additional engineering requirements mm -hmm. to accommodate two-phase, I'm inferring from what you just said that it's maybe not as onerous as as, as, I, as I think, but but it, it's, I, I'll ask it, you it's, and then see if these guys... Uh, yes, yeah, so I don't believe it's onerous. We did a lot of R&D to be able to basically resolve the main challenge, uh, but something that also I do like and I, de and, and I did not mention that when you use uh, a refrigerant-based implementation that you can also have a choice in terms of type of metal you use. So you can go from copper to aluminum, and if you go to aluminum, of course, it is a lower cost, is a low, is a lower weight, and also you can recycle aluminum much easier than copper. So, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, we know in this industry that, that, that the, the lowest cost, highest scale technology is going to win. But I know, I know Dell as well. Once you guys are locked and loaded on an engineering design, you know, you got to have a strong business case to change it. So, your thoughts on what what Luca just shared? We are open, just as uh, Dion said, we're, we're always open to, the, uh, to, to new, new technology, new technology development. We want to be sure that we are providing the best value at scale for our customers. Right now, as I mentioned, that decision is single phase direct to chip, but we're always evaluating and uh, we're, we're keeping an eye on those things. And again, we have a great team that is capable of looking at it not just from the marketing documents, but digging into the physics, making right. sure that it's going to provide the value that we believe it will at time and at scale. And that's really the key. It's easy to do things, and this is not saying anything about Seguente. I'm just saying in general, mm -hmm. it's easy to do things once on a test bench. It's hard to do things right. 10,000 times in, you know, and repeat that over and over again in the data center. Yeah, and I mean, I think the other thing that, that I think he alluded to which is 
minimizing risk, right? And especially as you start to deploy, you know, hundreds of thousands of GPUs, which is we're, we're starting to see, it, it becomes about how do you mitigate the risk? And then you talked about, you know, don't leak, right? That's, that's the first thing you want to make sure happen. But at this scale, you have to understand that there are going to be lots of risks introduced just by the sheer scale of the infrastructure. And so therefore you want to try to reduce as much as you can and, and you know, get it down to known quantities as much as you can. So Dan, you were mentioning ecosystem, you know, emphasizing yeah. that earlier. How do you think about um, this problem? When you right. think about something like uh, two-phase, yeah. is that something that NVIDIA would say, hey, we're going to do some core research on this, or are you, are you say, would you say, hey, let the Seguentes of the world do that. Right. We'll, we'll observe, partner, whatever. Yeah. How do you, what's your posture on that? So, so NVIDIA has definitely taken an active approach. So we, we were just recently in a project called Cooler Ships, which yeah. was sponsored by the DOE, and so that involved exploring a lot of different um, direct, you know, direct cooling technologies. And so, and we have internal resources. I mentioned, you know, Wade and some of our internal teams who are actively looking at a lot of these technologies to really work alongside our partners. So even though, you know, like I said, we're enabling our ecosystem, we're active participants. So we're not literally saying you guys figure it out. We're trying to be as prescriptive as we can where we can, um, but we also know that there's value for them to add in terms of being able to build some of the systems as well. And I want to ask you guys about immersion, because I, I, you know, I hear a lot of different stories. I've talked to some of the immersion yeah, guys yeah. here. You know, the the FUD is that the 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 Nvidia's and AMD's and Intel's won't warranty yet. I'll say yet is what I'm learning uh, the immersion, but there are third parties who will, mm -hmm. and you know, you guys will probably get there. Sure. Do we have thoughts on immersion? Who wants to pick it up? Tim, let's start sure. with you. So. Dell has been innovating in liquid cooling and immersion for a long time. Um, to our knowledge, we were the first to deliver a commercially a commercial system excuse, that was immersion cooled uh, over almost 15 years ago now. So we have a lot of experience with it. And the reality is that over time, we've we've come to realize that from a thermal perspective, there's not as much benefit as as it first appears, and that's just due to physics and chemistry and thermodynamics. That doesn't mean that it's not a useful or important technology. It just means that we need to match the use case correctly um, for the immersion technology and the, the what the customer needs. Again, scaling out to hundreds of thousands of GPUs in a data center, probably not immersion, but an edge deployment, a factory kind of data center in a box deployment, that becomes kind of interesting. So definitely not ruling it out, um, but we have found that it's probably more useful in those kind of special use cases where the customer can really take advantage of all the benefits of immersion. Yeah, and there's, look, we're going to see a million GPU clusters. I mean, it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. Oh, yeah. Thoughts on immersion? You want to? Oh, oh yes, I will be happy to talk a little bit about. Um, I just wanted to differentiate that you have two different two different approach. So a single phase immersion and two phase immersion. So keeping the same de de definition, right? Mm -hmm. um, I see immersion also as a, via uh, as a viable approach, although um, there is a lot of, and we can see here, a lot of study and, uh, and exploration to see, can we couple actually cold plate and immersion to basically extend the performance? Because Tim was mentioning in some of the use case, if the workload is very intense, you may have some challenge in terms of how you distribute the coolant because you don't have a cold plate, right? So you may have some stratification and dry out challenge. So um, a, a mix, let's say, between a cold plate uh, addressing, let's say, the primary component, CPUs and GPUs, and then let's say single phase immersion and cooling for the secondary side components can also work, right? Because you are basically addressing the high power but you had also captured the, um, the heat from the secondary side components. I see some challenge also, I mean, I have to say, scaling hundreds of thousands of pods in the way you service the pods and the way you deploy the pods, uh, there is, I believe, a, a lot of work and consideration to be done to deploy immersion cooling at scale, right? Okay, last question I'll ask each of you. I'll go around yeah. clockwise. So, and Jensen describes this so well. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we can all agree that we have entered the age of accelerated computing. Dion, it's in your title. Sure. We're not going back, general purpose computing. I won't say it's dead, right. but every workload is going to be accelerated. You sure. can agree on that. Sure. As well, the other, th what Jensen describes so well is with general purpose computing, 
when new chips came out, Excel ran faster. Right. Nice. Right. It was great. Yeah. But <laughs> now we're looking at a completely different dynamic. Yeah. New systems and new chips come out, and I say systems because it is a system. Yep. And new software yes. comes out. Capabilities. And, and it's accelerating much, much faster with new capabilities sure. that we never even could think of before. So, as it pertains to mm -hmm. the topic of direct liquid cooling, yeah. where do you see this going through the end of the decade? Is it pretty much where we are today? It's just gotta be built out and scaled? Or do you expect that by the end of the decade, Tim, we're going to see dramatic new int introductions of architecture in the data center that we're going to have to respond to? What are your thoughts on that? So, yeah, at the data center level, I think it's really important to keep in mind, I mean, we're, we're living the excitement of, yeah. of accelerators and HPC here, but by 2030, most of our sales at Dell are still going to be air-cooled. Mm -hmm. Most data centers are going to be air-cooled. We have to maintain focus on innovation from air mm -hmm. to liquid and enabling the customer where they're at, right? Now, to your question, will we see new technologies and new architectures? I absolutely believe that. As we start planning on half megawatt racks, it's a different architecture. That's a different way of thinking about building the data center, right? And we're working on it at Dell. We know our partners at NVIDIA are working on that. We know Seguente's also looking at innovative ways to implement that. And that's what I think we're, we're just at the beginning yeah. of seeing that. You know, I know we're working on thinking about how do we at Dell meet our customers' needs with a complete solution that we can deliver rapid time to deployment, right. meeting our customers' needs where they're at, um, whether it's air-cooled or liquid-cooled, working with NVIDIA where we need to say, hey, we really need an air-cooled SKU here. Right. Can you help us out? Um, they do, Yeah. because they want to sell GPUs. Absolutely. We want to sell them. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then we want to enable those for our customers who, for whatever reason, they're just not going to go liquid-cool. Right? Yeah. So we'll be there. We're going to see a really interesting set of uh, innovations here in the next five to 10 years. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, give us your take. It feels almost impossible to look out that far because of how quickly <laughs> no. things are changing. Like, but I think about if I go five years back, would I have predicted we would be where we are today? And I would absolutely say no. no. Um, but what I will say is, you know, I, I think in broader, broader um, strokes, I agree. You know, we'll see a spectrum. I, I think you will still see um, some workloads, some data centers that are still largely air cooled and using what I call mainstream parts. And just given the trend and the efficiency that we're able to drive by increasing the overall compute density, I think that trend will continue as well, especially as you start to see these scaling laws take into effect around both training and inference, driving more performance, more compute density. And so therefore, I think that trend will continue. Where we'll be in five to six years, I don't know, but I, I do think you will still see a continuum of both air to liquid to very dense, densely populated systems. And, and I, I think about too, the, the pace of technology, we always say, oh, the pace of technology is accelerating, and it is, yes. coming out of the factory, thanks right. to guys like you. <laughs> but the pace of adoption yeah. is not so easy. We talk about agents and agentic, that's going to, in my view, it's going to take a good five to 10 years yeah. to actually really build that out. And so, you know, applying this technology sometimes is a, is a challenge for customers, because sure. they've got a business to run. <laughs> but, Luca, I want you to make the case for, for two-phase, Mm -hmm. and why you think it will go mainstream. I'll give you the last word. Sure. So just at a high level, I want to mention, because when you discuss about the new data center architecture, this is, a, let's say, a liquid cooling uh, session or panel, but there will be a lot of challenge also on the power side, right? Yeah. So this is something that we did not mention, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, we have to cool the chips, but first of all, we need to power those. And this is also something that we need to think about, as well as also I want to say that um, as we increase the power of those racks, uh, there, there is something to keep in mind, a new innovation they need to come from the sustainability standpoint, how we actually can capture this heat to be able to reuse. Because if we can capture the heat at a high temperature, then we will be very sustainable because we get that, that, that directly use. So uh, just stepping back to your question about two-phase cooling, um, for us, is not uh, an, an R&D exercise. So we feel that we have completed the R&D phase. We actually, currently, we are shipping product. 
and uh, we actually we have the strategic partnership in place on the back end with the tier one server vendors to be able to provide our SKUs, which we normally we retrofit, we rack and stack and we ship, as well as also we have strong partnership on the front end to make sure that we have a com infrastructure provider company which they can help us to deploy and also do all the SLA and technical services. For me, I like to face, I believe there will be a transition, also the transition by the fact that um, with the water-based cooling, uh, if the heat load is going to increase, the only way to basically dissipate that amount of heat is to basically pump more water. But with the two-phase approach, you basically you can evaporate more liquid out of vapor so you can keep the mass flow rate lower. If you can keep the mass flow, flow rate lower, then you can start to basically keep lower size of tubes. You can keep the, um, the, 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 um, the, di the, di the dimension lower. And also something that I do like is that uh, if there are multiple water-based cooled racks, right? There are many thoughts about, okay, can I deploy a cold or cooled or two-phase cooled racks, right? The answer is yes, because with our implementation that, 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 that we have a top of the rack uh, CDUs, which is dielectric on one side and, uh, and uh, single-phase water on the other side, uh, any incoming flow rate and temperature from the floor standing CDUs, our technology can then take it. So there is no variation in the infra in infrastructure at all. So you can have many water base, many cold water base, and then you keep scaling the, 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 the data centers. But I want to make a final statement here. I enjoyed this session yeah. a lot. Great. I, I, I believe that uh, ev everyone will play an important role. So let's say from the chip makers all the way to the company, they, they, they provide services because we need uh, all of them to make sure that uh, as the power goes up, there is technology innovation across the board to make sure that we can make our customers happy. So I want. So you and Tim are friendly. There was a little <laughs> bit of red meat in there. <laughs> you want to respond? Okay, no, no, good. No, I, I, as I said before, we are continually evaluating technologies, <laughs> keeping our eyes out. We, we talk, and uh, and and we know what's going on, and uh, we we just want to make sure that we're providing the best value to our customers, and if that's Seguente, we'll take a look at it. It's an amazing thing about our industry, is yeah. innovation. You guys each play a very important role. Thanks so sure. much no, thanks for coming for on the panel. Tim, Dion, Luca, thanks. really a pleasure. Yes. And thank you for watching. This wraps up day one here at SC2024. My name is Dave Vellante. Yeah. Savannah Peterson and John Furrier here. We kick off tomorrow at 10 a.m. East, East Coast time. Go to thecube.net, check out all the videos, siliconangle.com for all the news and analysis and thecuberesearch.com for the deep analysis. Don't forget to go to thecubeai.com. Ask it a question, it'll give you an answer. Nice. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Very good. Thanks.